Good morning, Dr. Ali Reza. Good morning. Pleasure to connect. Lovely. Awesome. <clears throat> so we are almost about to start uh, the master class uh, in about a minute. Uh, so okay. people are still joining. We have already crossed about 100 people. Um, and uh, most of the audience comes from India. And it's about 11.30 p.m. at night. So yeah, I know. Yeah. Kudos to the, so kudos to the audience. That, yeah. If I knew yeah. that, I would recommend another time. But yeah. No, that's okay. That's okay. I think we, we understand that you know, when people work with the U.S. and India, of course. A lot of times, in fact, the first session that we have, was with uh, uh, James from Stanford University, and he had to do the session yes. late at night because it was 11 in the morning. So it's okay. I'm mean, like, uh, uh, the tables are just turned. Okay. So first of all, I think, you know, we, we can literally uh, officially start this masterclass. Hi, everyone. Uh, people are still pouring in. Thank you so much for loving Adora's masterclass. This is Saurabh Gupta, CEO, and Adora, CEO of Adora. And with me today for the third session, of masterclass is Dr. Ali Reza Reza from UC Davis. Uh, he is a renowned professor. He is a renowned researcher. Uh, he is also the director of the Digital Agriculture Lab at UC Davis. Uh, his passion being precision agriculture, digital AI and innovation, uh, all that can happen around agriculture and. We're all, most of the audience, by the way, Dr. Ali Raza, today is from that background. Like there are a lot of students from agriculture universities. In fact, the audience is not just, not just from India. You will have a lot of people coming from Southeast Asia uh, in this audience. In fact, a lot of people are coming from US as well. Uh, some of them from African universities as well. I think thanks to you because we, you have a good fan following there. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so welcome, sir. Uh, please uh, briefly introduce yourself, enlighten us what Dr. Ali Raza Pureza is and uh, what, how has been your journey until what you are today, and then we can kickstart the masterclass. All yours. Thank you very much, Surab, for your introduction. It's a great honor and privilege for me to join this international webinar series. And... Um, uh, I'm uh, excited to share some uh, of our research updates and uh, as well as uh, defining and describing the concepts of digital agriculture and technologies involved in this uh, concept. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, audience, I mean, like, I'm sure a lot of you already know about what the rules are here. Some of you have joined afresh. So how this session is going to work is the first uh, 90 minutes or 60 minutes, whatever Dr. Reza, Reza wants to take, uh, he will have his session and the master class. Post that, we will have a Q&A, sort of an ask me anything session. You can post all your questions in chat or in the question, the Q&A. Uh, all those who would like to come up and you know and be live with Dr. Ali Reza can raise their hands. If you are willing to, and then you can ask your question live. Uh, if you're willing to share your video, that would be great because that really uh, helps us to identify and understand you as well. And also the audience which is going to watch this masterclass later. So pretty simple stuff. Uh, and Dr. Reza, uh, if you really want to share your uh, screen or something, you have all the rights. Uh, of course, I'm here and you know, my other uh, you know, co-panelists will join too to facilitate the process. So... Um, I, I can you, can you share the table? Okay, can you share? Okay. Does it? Let me just loud. It. Okay, now, um, yes. Wonderful. Okay. So, how does it look like? Do you see my, my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Again, um, it's a great honor for me uh, to join this webinar and today I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of digital agriculture and uh, how AI and innovation can uh, revolutionize the way we farm and we grow plants. Um, I'm an associate professor at UC Davis. I run the digital agriculture lab here. 
and our focus uh, is mostly on sensing and remote sensing. So let me start with uh, explaining what digital agriculture, digital farming is. Uh, this uh, technology or digital farming employs uh, a range of uh, uh, smaller technologies to manage uh, agricultural operations more efficiently and uh, with the goal of increasing productivity and sustainability of farms. Um, here are some key technologies used in digital farming. Uh, well, satellite imagery and remote sensing is a um, pretty established technology in row crops, especially in the United States and many other countries. Drones and uh, unmanned aerial vehicles are kind of a new subject that recently with the um, uh, redu reduction in the price of drones and accessibility of drones to growers, there is more interest in uh, modeling and uh, developing interpretation analytical algorithms to convert the data collected by drones to some insight using GIS and of course GPS technology, which is not only uh, for the satellite, it's also used for automation and robotics, uh, which is another major uh, technology for digital agriculture, we all know that the uh, labor shortage is a big issue for today and future agriculture, and uh, we will need automated system to uh, to uh, make uh, some process autonomous and without the inter uh, interaction with humans. Internet of Things, uh, another type of uh, uh, sensing that is usually used uh, as a like soil moisture sensors or some sensors that are attached to the plant or the tree uh, in a uh, network and they uh, provide this information in a real time uh, to a cloud or edge computing. Well, uh, as you see, there is a lot of data collected in uh, agriculture these days. So agriculture will be, uh, very uh, um, data uh, uh, depend a lot on data. So we need to be able to manage all this data, process this data, um, analyze and convert them to some actionable insight. Water uh, is a big issue for agriculture. Uh, so we need to use our water in, uh, in a smart way. Uh, big data analytics, uh, blockchain, and uh, virtual and augmented reality. These are other technologies that um, researchers in digital agriculture are focusing on. So with this introduction, I want to emphasize on the importance of uh, this paradigm shift that we need in agriculture. Um, there is this uh, thing called Earth Overshoot Day that some of you may be familiar uh, with this. And it's not um, a good news, obviously. It's a day when we, uh, the humans, uh, use up all the resources that the Earth can regenerate in one year. Well, as you can see in this graph back in 1970s, uh, we were doing all right and almost everything uh, was regenerated in the same year. But uh, look at this year or last year, uh, we, would, we could only uh, regenerate half of what we used in one year. And this year, the overshoot day is on August 2nd, uh, yesterday. So that means starting today, whatever resource we use, they are gone forever and we cannot regenerate that. Uh, so that means we are using up resources faster than the earth can uh, regenerate them. And that's not sustainable, obviously. Agriculture is a big part of this problem, uh, but it can be also part of the solution. By using uh, digital technology, we can optimize crops and food production systems, and um, that could be a starting point for turning things around. So um, 
a little bit about my lab. My uh, lab focus is mostly on remote sensing. Uh, we try to develop interpretation models for drone and satellite imagery to convert this data into uh, some insight that uh, can girl use as a decision support to make better decision during the season. And uh, we know how decision making can change the whole story in a farming season. So most of these decisions are not based on data, they are based on usually uh, historic information or what the farmer learned from their parents, uh, which could be good decision, but um, when we have data and we can make informed decision, uh, there is no need to make decision based on gut feeling. So my lab is trying to develop these decision support tools for growers so they can use them and make the data-driven, uh, adapted data-driven decision-making. So uh, you may be familiar with the concept of precision farming, which has been around for maybe 30, 40 years now. And precision agriculture is a way of farming that uses technology to help grow crops in the best way possible uh, without or with minimum uh, impact on the environment. And this slide shows a picture of how precision agriculture works from uh, a start to finish in one season. So first we use uh, sensors, uh, different type of sensors, remote sensing, um, soil sensors, or some other specialized sensor to collect data about the crops or about the animals, uh, like how much they are growing, how much water they use, how much nutrition they need, if they are suffering from any stress. And then uh, we process and analyze this data to make um, some insight that could help girls to make better decision about how to improve the crop production. And this, uh, help, uh, this would be uh, a good help uh, for us to make in advanced planning. Uh, for example, early in the season, we can know how much water uh, or how much nitrogen fertilizer we will need. And finally, after we interpret this data, we can uh, apply that in a site specific application. All of these data that are collected are georeferenced, so they can convert, uh, they can be converted to insight maps. Uh, and insight maps can be converted to prescription maps that uh, shows us exactly uh, what would be our application rate and uh, each location. So, in short, I can say precision agriculture is a technology-based way of farming that uses data to help farmer grow crops better and more sustainably. But the digital agriculture is a little bit uh, more focused on data and uh, transferability and um, uh, robotics. So uh, we can say digital farming is an updated version of precision farming. So I'm gonna start with a story about uh, um, how uh, these tools can be useful. And I get these questions a lot in my presentations. Okay, so we know all this stuff, we use this advanced technology, how they are helping us. So uh, as I learned today, uh, many of the audience today are involved in agricultural uh, process somehow, and um, you may notice that uh, the yields from um, plant to plant and from year to year changes a lot. Although uh, um, plants in one farm are all sisters from the same parents, from the same germplasm, uh, they're growing in an exactly same environment. So theoretically, they should grow similarly. But the fact uh, and our observation at UC Davis over the last 20 years is that there is a high level of variability 
Uh, and this variability can really hold back the potential of the farm. Uh, this slide shows um, an almond orchard. And uh, this is a kind of the average yield at different uh, left side and the right side of this orchard. So you can see how one side is producing a lot more, about 6,000 pounds per acre of dry kernel uh, nut, while the other side only gets about 2,000 pounds per acre. And that's a big difference. And um, what does that mean? It means the farmer does not uh, get the most out of their field. But here's the good news. As long as we know this yield variability and we can understand that and we can predict that, we can start to make some uh, real progress. For example, with this yield uh, forecast map, we can optimize our use of water and nutrient. Uh, we can um, target a specific areas for different treatments and even try out some new techniques. Um, this all adds up to a more efficient farming and a better result for this orchard. Plus, a yield map can help you make sense of all uh, the other data you're collecting, like uh, remote sensing or ground-based sensors. It's a powerful tool to unlock new insight and improving uh, an orchard uh, productivity and management strategy. And uh, this presentation, I'm going to show some of the ways to use this digital farming technology, um, mostly in specialty crops. So as uh, I showed in the previous slide, we could see a, a spatially variable yield in one single orchard, uh, which uh, had a pattern of higher yield in the right in the left side, but the thing is that this year and uh, here you can see a pistachio orchard uh, and the yield in this pistachio orchard from 2002 to 2007. And we can see uh, there is a yield variability pattern in each year, but that uh, yield variability pattern doesn't um, uh, align from year to year. So there is a, a spatial variability and there is a temporal variability. Uh, that means we need to be able to constantly monitor our field for uh, I, uh, I, identifying this kind of pattern. So let's get back to our almond orchard uh, story. And uh, as I said, people often ask why it's important to understand the variability of crop yield and how it actually affects the grower's wallet. Uh, let's get back to this example. Say um, we have this almond field and we found out that the right half produces uh, 44,000 pounds more than the left side. So that's, first of all, is a lot of yield potential uh, that can be increased. But if we don't know this, we cannot do anything. So the first thing, if we want to do improvement, is the ability to measure. And in this case, to measure or forecast the yield. Now let's talk about the application of fertilizer and how efficiently. Uh, so the left side of the field needs about uh, 2,000 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, and this is based on the formulation that uh, was developed at UC Davis. But the right side needs 5,000 pounds. So if we manage the field uniformly based on the high yielding section, we'll end up um, wasting about 3,000 pounds of nitrogen in the left side. That's not good for the grower's budget. Uh, it's not good for the environment. It's not even good for the tree because it will impose a long-term damage on the tree. And we know these are perennial crops, so we need to make sure that uh, they stay healthy and productive for a couple of decades. 
So what's the solution? Uh, of course, there are many ways uh, to solve this problem. Most of the orchards in California, they have uh, an irrigation system, which usually applies a uniform amount of water to every tree. But some of these systems allow for uh, some modification. For example, we can divide uh, an orchard into two half and then manage each half separately, uh, apply water uh, separately. And uh, I should mention that fertilizers are also injected through the irrigation line. So uh, whatever precision we have in uh, our irrigation system, we will have that for uh, nitrogen application and fertilizer application. But um, here, with this, we can, uh, first of all, save about 3,000 pounds of fertilizer. And uh, we make sure that uh, there will be no leaching of this uh, excess fertilizer into the groundwater or into the soil that could contaminate both soil and water, and that could be an environmental hazard. Uh, this could be a brief introduction in remote sensing. Um, light and plant um, has very interesting interactions. When light uh, is provided to the plant, some of this light is absorbed by the plant tissue. Uh, the biochemical uh, component of plants can absorb light at different wavelengths. And some of this uh, light is actually transmitted, but some part of this light is uh, reflected back. And that's the part that can be captured by a camera. So um, sun, light is have a visible near infrared 2,500 nanometers. And that's the active range of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can use for remote sensing because uh, the, most of the remote sensing sensors in agriculture are um, passive. So we need a light source. And uh, in our case, our light source is sun. And if you look at the different uh, traits in the lower part of this slide, we can see that chlorophyll, carotenoid, anthocyanin, equivalent water uh, thickness, um, leaf mass comes in this range. And each of these uh, uh, traits actually absorb light in a diff different part of this uh, electromagnetic range. So by looking at different part, we can see uh, we can measure how much of these biochemical traits are available. Um, so this is a very um, common uh, leaf spectra. Uh, let me see if I can have a pen. So uh, this is the reflectance. Um, and uh, we can see only this part of the spectral range which is the visible range from 400 to 700 nanometers. And all this area is invisible to uh, our eye. Uh, so the blue line here is what we see as a reflectance and the orange one, oh, sorry. The orange one is transmitters. And we can see the transmitters and reflectance are pretty much, they look the same. Whatever is in the middle with green uh, color, they uh, we called it absorb absorbance, and that's the amount of light that is absorbed. So within the visible range, there is a lot of light that is absorbed uh, here in this range. So um, we can see a big absorption in blue and red and a little bit less absorption at green. That's why most of the vegetation looks green to us. So uh, overall, we can, um, we can um, categorize remote sensing uh, models into 
uh, empirical, fully data-driven methods that try to uh, link the raw data that is collected by sensors to plant traits without paying attention to the interaction of light and plant tissue. Or we can use the uh, physical-based methods that uh, they took into account actually the uh, how light interacts with plant. Uh, and uh, that can give us a more a consistent result uh, because we consider everything uh, when we are analyzing the this interaction. But when we do only empirical modeling, uh, the inherent um, characteristic of the data set that we can use to calibrate a model can uh, make our model biased to that data set. And that may not work in another time and space, which is a major problem in remote sensing application for agriculture. So uh, empirical approach, as I mentioned, there are, um, so yeah, they are sensitive. Uh, when we want to measure how crops are doing, there are some limitations um, fusing uh, empirical approach. Uh, as I mentioned, they are, can be sensitive to different factors, for example, to atmospheric conditions and also how data was collected. Uh, I have a whole set of uh, slides about that. And we also have to be uh, aware of uh, specific features, uh, such as uh, the geography of the field and the geometry of sun and camera angles. So we have to take into account a lot of different things when we are using these methods. Uh, and the ground-based measurement of the crops that are usually used for uh, labeling the data and making the empirical models can be uncertain. And uh, that would make the remote sensing model uh, a little bit uh, unreliable. We also need to be aware of how we are sampling the data. But um, don't worry, we have other approaches we can use to get around these limitations and make sure our crop are healthy and happy. And I will discuss about them. So uh, with this introduction, I'm gonna start uh, the first project that I would like to explain today. Uh, first of all, this is an aerial image of a citrus orchard in South California. Uh, do you see any uh, problem with this image? And I see someone raising their hand. So I'm not sure if uh, I can answer a question right now or they should wait until the end of the presentation. No, it's OK, Dr. Perez. We'll take them later. OK, we can take them later. So, uh, so please write down your questions to don't forget. Uh, one thing that we can see in this image is that in the top right corner of this image, we can see a higher intensity compared to the lower left corner of this image. And that's a problem that uh, is called hot spot. And many people uh, don't uh, take this uh, alteration of the image seriously and take into account so they use this imagery and this kind of data in their analysis. And um, when they want to use it in another location, it doesn't work. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the effect of sun and camera geometry in uh, drone-based remote sensing. This is a research that uh, has been done by my PhD candidate, Hamid Jaffa Biglu. And um, so let's uh, start with a different type of analysis that we can do. So when we get remote sensing data, we can uh, use a structural analysis or a spectral analysis. Uh, structural traits emphasize relative reflectance values rather than the absolute energy of the photons because they are used to create a 3D model 
of the plant. So it's all about in the understanding the geometry and how uh, light uh, reflected uh, differently from one pixel to another. And uh, even an RGB uh, imagery can be good enough. In contrast, the second category, which is a spectral analysis, it conserves the absolute value of the energy that uh, is reflected by the plant. It involves um, accurately measuring reflected light from surface at different directions and wavelengths and uh, correlating plant characteristics with their spectral response, as I explained. So the core of our research concentrates on this spectral response category. Uh, so let, let me show you quickly uh, how this has an impact. So let me stop share and share another screen. Uh, so in this screen, you can see um, my lab website. And if you go to the decision support tools, uh, we have something that we call a radiative transfer model a simulator. So uh, this is an interactive app that can visualize how light is absorbed at different wavelengths based on uh, different uh, uh, traits. For example, uh, here we can see, so let's see if I can make it a little bit smaller. Okay, so uh, here we can see bars for different uh, biochemical traits, for example, chlorophyll, carotenoid, anthocyanin, water protein, and carbon-based. And each of these uh, biochemical traits absorb light in different Bands. For example, if we add some chlorophyll here, we can see that the light is absorbed mostly in the visible band because chlorophyll is a pigment and um, it mostly absorbs light in uh, blue and red region. We can add some carotenoid, uh, which is within the same range, but which uh, have a more pronounced impact on the green band. We can uh, add some anthocyanin. Uh, anthocyanin um, has a red color. So that means it absorbs a lot of green and blue. So all of these three leaf pigments absorb uh, light only in the visible band. But if we have um, some uh, water content in the leaf and we add that, we can see the impact that is actually happening in the short wave infrared, starting from one uh, or 900 nanometer all the way to 2,500 nanometer. And we can see two major valley, and these two valley are called the uh, water absorption band. We can add some protein, and that also has some impact in the short wave infrared. And finally, we can add uh, CBC. So, we can play with these bars until we get as close as possible graph to this uh, dotted line graph, which is our observation. But we can also optimize uh, using AI. And uh, so after we optimize, this is the result. So this is the best matching we can simulate to the actual observation. And we can also take a look at the uh, mean a square error here that uh, shows how much deviation we have from the actual spectrum. But with this, we can look at these values and these values are the attributes that we are looking for our plan. This tool is available in my lab. So if you want to play with it and uh, learn a bit more about that, please feel free to do so. Okay, so let me get back to my presentation. All right. So, uh, so, uh, so 
as I mentioned, most of our analysis is based on reflectance. And uh, in remote sensing, we define the reflectance factor as the ratio of reflectance from one target object to the ratio of a reflect a reference surface. Um, and uh, a reference surface is a Lambertian surface uh, that reflect almost 100% the light that uh, is uh, illuminated to it. So it's a lossless, theoretically, lossless, uh, there's no absorption, no transmission, 100% will be reflected. And by uh, using this formula of C over uh, B, we can measure the reflectance factor. Um, for a Lambertian, surface, this reflectance, regardless of the irradiance direction, the reflectance is equal in all directions. That's why from each direction you look at the Lambertian surface, you can see it with the same kind of intensity, but that's not a reality in uh, agriculture. So here we can see a leaf. First of all, we can see like these areas that is uh, glare uh, and this area that are darker. So that means we are not dealing with a Lambertian surface. We are actually dealing with a surface that is a combination of Lambertian and a specular surface. Um, so if we consider a perfect lossless diffusing surface, that would be here. And we can see in all direction, it reflects the same amount of energy. Um, but here in a leaf surface, we can see that the amount of energy reflected in different locations are not uh, um, the same. So at one direction specifically, we can get a much more reflectant uh, intensity, and that would be the area with glare. So Reflectance from this surface is a combination of body reflectance and specular reflectance. What we are looking for is body reflectance, which is an indication of the uh, biochemical traits in the leaf. And what uh, prevents us to get that is the specular reflectance. So what we get is a combination of these two. So we need to be able to decouple these two. So uh, the main parameter if in reflectance factor are irradiance, which is the incoming light from the sun, radiance, which is the um, reflectance, uh, reflected amount of energy from the target, and also the angles, the angle, the sun angles, how high the sun is in the sky, and the camera view angle. So uh, for the first uh, part of this parameter, the irradiance, we need to measure uh, sun irradiance and variation of sun irradiance during the data collection with a downwelling sensor, for example. Downwelling sensor is a light sensor within the, radio, uh, within the range of electromagnetic um, spectrum that the camera is working and is mounted on the top of the drone, pointing at the sun at the all time and measuring how much light is being uh, provided. Uh, or alternatively, we can uh, use a standard reflectance panel, something like this, which has a measured and known reflectance at the wavelengths of different channels of the multispectral camera. So, uh, there are three common methods uh, to measure the factor contributing to reflectance. First, we can use a standard panel, for example. This is a reflectance panel that I showed. Uh, we can do one measurement before the flight and one measurement after the flight. Uh, and we can assume that the variation between these two measurements was linear. Uh, or we can use uh, the downwelling sensor that makes measurement in a time interval, for example, every second 
so we can have a better understanding of how much uh, light has changed or if it was linear or not linear, which is in most cases is not linear, but it has its own uh, problem as well. Or another method is to put the downwelling sensor on the ground. Uh, this has the benefit of measuring the light at the level of our uh, plant or so uh, the atmospheric uh, impact between the drone and plant won't have an impact on, on our data. And also when uh, you have a downwelling sensor on the drone, drone is always moving, sometimes uh, moving, uh, leaning forward, sometimes leaning backward. So it doesn't have a constant angle of view to the sun. And that could um, manipulate the measurement, which could make a problem. So uh, each of these methods has pros and cons, and we need to use a combination of these methods if we want to make sure our data are reliable. <laughs> so, these are examples of methods and issues that are somehow mitigated for irradiance measurement. Uh, for example, this is an example of image calibration using light sensor. And uh, during this flight, there was um, cloud passing. And here is exactly the images that were taken during the cloud pass. Uh, we start here, we end here. Uh, if we use only the reflectance panel, we will not capture this variation in light in the middle of the flight. So that's why we need to do combination of different methods. Uh, this is another example. Uh, after we process the imagery, we can see uh, changes in the intensity that does not necessarily reflect the uh, plant health status or plant biochemical traits. This is um, irrelevant to plant itself. It's just a function of the um, uh, irradiance. So the next thing uh, I want to discuss about is the radiance. So our objective is to measure radiance using our camera. It's important to note that what we capture can be influenced by many different variables. And uh, to obtain an accurate estimation of radiance, we must effectively uh, identify and eliminate the impact of these uh, factors. So a camera record a digital number. Digital number doesn't mean anything until we convert them to reflectance, and I'll explain how we convert them. So in capturing radiance, uh, we are dealing with digital number, which depending on the bit depth of the camera, uh, it can vary. For example, if the bit depth is eight, we are dealing with uh, values between zero and 255. If we are having like a 12-bit camera, the value can be uh, between 0 and 4,000. Uh, so, and that's what we initially measure. But our goal is to calibrate these images to remove all external factors and obtain radiance as a, a physical unit. Uh, so, one straightforward approach is to include a standard reflectance panel in the frame and calibrate the entire image based on that. Uh, but that means we assumed all other factors remain constant during the flight. Another method involves utilizing a formula, um, which is usually provided by the uh, manufacturer of the camera, or we can derive that from a lab um, uh, experiment. And we use that to convert digital number to radius. Um, that would factor in uh, and kind of normalize all the value variables. This method is reliable, but the coefficient in the formulas may change over time. 
and uh, we need to recalibrate, which could be difficult. So finally, it's worth noting the angles and uh, potentially influential factors are often completely overlooked in this process. So we need to develop a better method. So the third is angle and all we do for angle calibration is to take nadir images, uh, which is exactly underneath the, can the camera and camera is always looking 90 degrees down. Uh, but that means we, we assume that the entire frame is nadir, which is an incorrect assumption. Our ultimate goal uh, is to ensure that we want um, we measure reflectance solely uh, related to the condition of the plants. And this requires careful accounting for an elimination of external factors that could influence our readings. With um, this application uh, and this calibration techniques, we uh, make some uh, very good observation, which I show in the next slide. So, okay, so let's say we went through all the three uh, steps. Uh, we solved the vignetting effect, we uh, solved the dark current, all sensor dependent and environmental depend dependent uh, sources of error. And still we see the issue. And that's the issue that I introduced in the beginning a slide that we have higher intensity in the top right corner of this image. Uh, this is not linked to any of the factors that we consider. And uh, this uh, phenomenon cause, uh, uh, is called hotspot. And uh, it and uh, a function of the sun angle and camera angle and camera field of view. So let's see. Yeah, so this shows if we uh, focus on this area, we definitely see less shadow and more reflectance. So as shown here, uh, we can encounter a wide range of scenarios within a single image frame. Uh, the field of view or FV of the camera can introduce significant variation in observation angles that could lead to substantial differences in captured imagery. So we need to pay attention of how big our lens is and probably don't use a very wide lens which would increase the chance for including hot spot in the frame. I should also make a, a distinction between a specular reflection and hot spot, uh, which are two different uh, phenomena. Uh, so here on the left, you can see a specular reflection from a ditch besides an orchard and a hot spot. Uh, which in this case happened here. We ran a few experiment with uh, some Lambertian uh, kind of fabric uh, with known reflectance. Uh, we had the hottest spot issue around the area that falls on the line that passes through the camera and sun. What does that mean? So basically, if you see the shadow of your camera in your live view uh, of drone, that means you are having hotspot in the imagery and it will be very difficult to calibrate and efficiently use those imagery. They, most cases, they go directly into the trash because nothing can be extracted from them. So uh, how that is important, that means if we look at a single tree from different angles, we will see different reflectance. That doesn't mean that tree changes the biochemical traits in a, like one minute. That means just 
there are some other factors influencing the image and can influence also analytics. So let's uh, take a look. So here you can see that uh, with the drone imaging, we usually have some overlaps, front overlaps and side overlap. That means one single plant can appear in maybe 20 or more or less, depending on how much over, overlap do you define. Uh, uh, and um, each of these images look different. So let's take a closer look. So this is the one that was captured at Nadir. And if you compare that to other, we can see that the tree looks different. We actually measured this um, and uh, we can uh, kind of plot that and model that. So here, the yellow line shows the sun direction. On the x-axis, we can see the view angle on the principal plane, which is the plane that passes through sun and camera. So uh, what we saw was a huge difference. Let's uh, take an idea view of one of these trees as a, as a reference and show how uh, of Nadir uh, imagery can be different. So these points shows the reflectance factor of the same tree that was observed from different view angle. And if we quantitatively look at this, they can change within the dynamic range of the measurement. So it can be 50% more or 50% less. And as I explained at the beginning of this presentation, the spectral models in remote sensing are relying on the reflectance uh, intensity at different bands. And if that reflectance intensity is uh, impacted by sun and camera geometry this much, how can those results be reliable? It cannot. So what should we do? Here again, uh, we can see uh, a lot of measurement for a green channel only. And uh, we can see that the values are changing between 0 0.075 to 1.15, which is um, almost twice the minimum. Uh, and this is reflectance in green. If we look at different channels, blue, green, red, red edge and near infrared, which are the uh, common five uh, channels of multispectral cameras, we can see the same pattern happening everywhere. Even in near infrared that we are dealing with um, like high reflectance, we can see the exact same pattern. Some of you may be familiar with normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. And this index has the word normalized at the beginning, which means it's supposed to normalize the data and get rid of this kind of uh, manipulation. But we can see even NDVI was hugely impacted. So uh, many applications depend on NDVI and NDVI is not measured reliably based on this result. So can we say all those NDVI analytics are questionable? Well, they can be. So uh, this is um, uh, a visualization on both principal plane and cross plane. And uh, let me see, I think there is an animation here. Okay, so no, there is not. Uh, but you can see that in both directions, we can uh, see inconsistency in both principal plane and cross plane. So this is interesting. We flew at different time of the year in December, March, September, July, in four different seasons to capture different sun angles from very low to very high in summer. And we can see 
that obviously in July, when the sun is at the highest point, uh, we have the most variation in data based on sun view angle geometry. And that's not a good news because actually most of our data collection are in summer. Uh, here we can see that in December, it's pretty linear or flat. So maybe there is no impact of sun hotspot. Uh, this is obviously uh, the spring and this is the fall, which has moderately still linear, but here we can see it's not linear at all. So if you want to uh, illustrate this in 3D, it would look like something like this. Uh, we compared our result with uh, radiative transfer modeling uh, in uh, canopy level, and uh, we figured out that the hot spot appeared exactly at the same location. Well, obviously, this is simulation, so it, there is some difference with actual data on top, but the location is the same. So... Uh, Another problem that I'm going to discuss today is that, uh, as I mentioned, we collect a lot of data overlapping imagery. And then we import them into some uh, stitching software and they create a mosaic file uh, by combining everything from different view angles, from uh, different light condition, etc. And then we extract data from these mosaic files. Uh, we saw a lot of serious issues in the output of this software, uh, such as Pix4D or Agisoft, and not only from a spectral response point of view, but also from the shape and appearance of the object. So let's take a look at the, some of these artifacts. Uh, so here, again, we get back to a citrus orchard. And uh, we can see in this citrus orchard, there was a tower. This is actually an ET tower that uh, measures some uh, weather data and wind. And in this mosaic generated by Pix4D, this tower is not visible at all. But here in the method that my lab uh, created, we can clearly see the... Um, Power. So this is one problem that we try to solve. Another problem is uh, that because this kind of software tried to use some kind of filters from the same pixel appeared in multiple imagery, uh, they tend to uh, uh, merge around the average. So there will be a lot of textual information um, that will be gone. So again, here we can see the difference between the two methods and how it would uh, improve the quality of the imagery. We need to make sure we get high quality data if we want to have high quality analysis. Uh, so when we have hotspot inside the image frame, we can observe uh, more than 100% differences in reflectance of the same tree. That's one thing that can be uh, concluded from this presentation. So here you can see, for example, the reflectance in the middle is uh, less than the reflectance in the lower left and is more than the reflectance in the lower left and less than the reflectance in top right. So we developed an Another web application based on this to help people who wants to fly with the drone to find out the best time for fly, uh, to avoid uh, having hotspot issue in their imagery. And I can show you again this app in the website. So let me again share um, the website. So if you go to decision support tools and use the when to fly app, uh, it will take a few seconds to load, but this app will help you to understand uh, what time would be the best time of the day 
to fly. So the first thing that you need to select is the date that you want to fly. Uh, it's by default is today. Uh, you need to select the camera. And these are some of the common uh, multispectral cameras that we have in the market. So let's say, for example, DJI Phantom 4 multispectral. Then you need to select the latitude and longitude. And I understand that many of uh, the audience today are from uh, India. So let's select some location in India. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, close to southern part of the India. So let's select this area. So based on uh, the method that I explained, uh, there will be hotspot effect starting from 11 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. That means it's extremely recommended not to fly at this time. It's a little bit different than what uh, was uh, recommended uh, as a common um, rule of thumbs in remote sensing to fly at solar noon, which is exactly in this red part. And what we recommend is to avoid this, because if you fly at solar noon on this date, in this location with this camera, you will have hot spot in your data and your data will be useless. Okay, so let's get back to the presentation. Uh, there is um, one hour gone and I have a lot more slides. So maybe I should uh, do a little faster. So the take home message from this presentation, hot spot is important and it's not a spot, it's actually a region. Uh, sometimes solar noon is not a good time to fly uh, against the common recommendation. And we discussed about that. And without accounting for external effects, reliable and consistent result will not happen. Also, we saw that the software that produced Mosaic's file uh, is not recommended to be used for extracting a spectral data. So another, so let's say, okay, so we have a good model and good uh, data collection protocol, and we take care of all these problems in pre-processing. Now we want to uh, use this data for some of our application. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the application that we have in California. Almond is a major crop in California and yield forecasting is important. This research was done by my PhD student, uh, Mamtana Chakraborty, uh, who is uh, also funded by AI Institute for Food System. So the whole idea is that the number of flowers during the flowering season uh, for almond uh, is actually related to the number of nuts that we can expect from the almond tree. So here you can see different uh, kind of flowering trees. Uh, we uh, used an RGB drone to capture aerial view at Nadir. So here are different uh, images with different conditions, the different bloom density. Most of the almond production are in the middle of the California, which is called the Central Valley of California, which is uh, one of the best area in the world for uh, cultivating fruits and nuts. It has a Mediterranean climate, so many of the crops that are produced in Mediter uh, Mediterranean area can be also grown in California, and one of them is almond. But California uh, went too far with almond, and they are producing 80% of total almond in the world. So it's really important crop for California. It's important to ma be managed precisely. Uh, and if we can manage that precisely, we can see the impact on the environment and uh, also on the crop production efficiency. So we developed a model 
uh, that can take the image of a tree at the flowering time and convert that to a bloom density, uh, which means how much flower, uh, how many flower are uh, available in this tree. So uh, basically we needed uh, to label some of these trees. So we used uh, an HSV segmentation approach, manually segmented uh, many of these uh, trees to bloom and non-bloom and then uh, we use the deep learning model uh, unit uh, to compare and train, first of all, with this data and then compare with HSV segmentation. And uh, we can see here on the top left, a scatter plot that there is a very good agreement between uh, bloom segmented by the deep learning and also by the HSV segmentation method. We compare this with another vegetation indices that is usually used for bloom uh, measurement in Amen, which is called enhanced bloom index. And uh, we can see that the result for that method is not comparable to what we developed. We also compared our bloom density information with the actual crop load. Crop load is the number of uh, nuts per tree um, rather than weights of the nuts. So uh, we can see there is a very good agreement between uh, bloom density for different cultivars and the crop load. Uh, so here you can see uh, different varieties. non pearl is a major variety of almond in California. Wood colony and Monterey, they are mostly pollinators for um, non pearl On the right, we can see the maps that we created for the three years of this study, showing the peak bloom uh, for each tree that didn't happen interestingly in the same day. So in the middle, you can see uh, every tree uh, on what day in the February they had the maximum number of bloom. Usually each variety uh, blooms and maximize the bloom um, within a few years, a few days. And on top, we can see the bloom density. And on the lower part, we can see the crop load, which is measured per row instead of per tree. So that's what the data we had. Uh, this is just a quick animation of how uh, flowering progress during the month of February, starting probably on February 9, and it goes up, and then it the, the flowers drops and the leaves comes out at the beginning of March. So uh, an automated approach for almond bloom density could estimate um, the um, crop load and uh, using a deep learning model uh, with UNET um, and some other details about uh, this a study that I am going to skip so we can have more time to discuss about other projects. So another focus of my lab is on plant nitrogen monitoring. And I'm gonna start with GRAPE. This uh, research was led by um, Yuto Kamiya, uh, visiting a scholar in my lab from Kubota company uh, in Japan. First of all, uh, why do we need to monitor nitrogen? Uh, nitrogen is essential for plant growth, especially at the vegetative stage of, of the growth. Uh, and uh, deficiency or excess of N will have a negative impact on, on the crop. Obviously, uh, deficiency can lead to lower yield, can cause... Uh, soil contamination, groundwater contamination, and it will also have a negative impact on the plant itself in the long term. We did that survey 
to see what percentage of Gilip growers are actually using a leaf nitrogen measurement and 79% of them answered yes. But only 14% uh, said that they use this data for managing nitrogen in the field. And that's a very low value, low number. So the reason is that the conventional leaf tissue analysis is uh, lacking the uh, spatial uh, information. So usually there is one, two, three samples um, provided to the lab for the entire vineyard, which is collected from uh, vines at different locations. So the grower wants to have an average um, nitrogen status for the vineyard, which again uh, ignores the spatial variability of, nit of nitrogen content in the field. But now with the remote sensing and also with our extensive tissue sampling, we realize that there is a high level of variability in nitrogen level, even uh, among uh, wines that are besides each other. So uh, this is um, a workflow for how we can uh, uh, estimate nitrogen. Uh, using a multispectral or hyperspectral imagery. So first of all, we need to separate each plant because each plant is a different story. Uh, remove the background and uh, average spectral, for example, for each band and then predict. Uh, but how to predict is to make some uh, leaf harvesting at the time of data collection, dry them, grind them, and do some chemical analysis to see what is the actual end content of that leaf. And uh, that leaf is a representative of the whole um, vine. So this assumption, first of all, this assumption is problematic because obviously we will have a nitrogen variability in the vine. So depending on which part of the vine we collect our sample, we will come up with different values. So within one vine, we will have a lot of nitrogen variability. You can ask, think of uh, in a vineyard, how much variability we are talking about. And it's not uh, very wise to consider the entire vineyard as one sample and apply uniformly. At the leaf level, uh, we can measure uh, higher quality spectral data using a spectrometer uh, point measurement, which uh, doesn't have a lot of a spatial variability, but has a very large spectral uh, resolution. And the device that we have uh, can measure light between 400 to 2,500 nanometers uh, which is the uh, working range of radiometric uh, uh, working range of electromagnetic spectrum for remote sensing in agriculture. So uh, one method is to use um, empirical pure data driven approach such as uh, machine learning or regression. And in this case, we have a bunch of data. We train our data with the labels that we get from the leaf analysis, and we come up with a model. And then when we have an uh, unseen data, we can use that model to predict N. Prediction performance is generally good if we talk only about one vineyard. But if we want to transfer this model to the vineyard in the neighboring area, or we want to transfer this model to another phenological stage of the uh, plant growth, that doesn't work. So that's the problem. Another problem is that uh, we don't exactly know how the machine learning tries to link the spectral data to N. And again, there might be some specific condition to the vineyard that we collect data. And that specific condition will make our model bias. 
which is uh, exactly what we don't want. It depends on um, measuring a lot of leaf tissue samples and doing lab analysis, which is expensive. So this considered $20 per sample, it's gonna be $3,000 only for one data set, which uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, especially if you want to mm, train a good machine learning uh, application, you need to provide that with a lot of label data. And with this condition, we are not able to do this. Alternatively, we can uh, use simulation and physically based model, which are based on radiative transfer theory. And that's kind of uh, using a mechanistic approach to uh, retrieve some primary plant traits, uh, such as the ones that I mentioned. And that's based on absorption of the light. Uh, so uh, these models are still uh, being developed, but the fact about this mechanistic approach is that they can somehow uh, ensure the consistency of the model over time and space. That means they are not impacted by the specific condition of one data set because there is no data set that is used to calibrate them. We use um, this theory to generate a synthetic data set. And then we train our uh, model with this synthetic data, and then we apply that on actual data. So the cost of the Grand Truth data is uh, zero. And uh, the cost of data collection is zero and the reliability and consistency of the result is much higher. The accuracy is not comparable to um, least square regression or um, other machine learning methods because of course those uh, approaches, they um, consider all characteristic of the spectral reflectance while in physically based, we only look at the portion of the electromagnetic uh, spectra for each traits. So here is a comparison between machine learning and physically based prediction. And uh, we can see both are acceptable. Also, we can see machine learning uh, is a little bit better, but um, remember that this model cannot be transferred. It's not generalizable. This model is. Uh, so this is at the canopy level uh, for retrieving nitrogen. There are a few things that I need to mention to justify why we don't have a good result here compared to machine learning. First of all, when we go from leaf level to canopy level, uh, we are reducing the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that can be sensed. Because at the ground level, we can use a point measurement a spectrometer that provides us high spectral resolution data in a full range. In aerial, uh, however, we only have access to visible and near infrared. And within visible and near infrared, we can only measure chlorophyll, uh, leaf pigments such as uh, anthocyanin and um, carotenoid, and maybe a little bit of the vegetation density. We don't have access to water content, to protein content. But we know that uh, protein is actually the main proxy for nitrogen. So if we want to measure nitrogen, we need to be able to measure protein. Protein can be detected between 21 and 2200 nanometers, which is way beyond the capability of uh, aerial cameras, uh, aerial multispectral cameras. So in this case, we only rely on chlorophyll and some other pigments, which has a shaky relationship with them. So that's the reason did not 
worked really well. Another reason is that we use the ProSale, which is a one-dimensional uh, three, uh, one-dimensional canopy level RTM. Uh, ProSale considers different medium in one dimension, so doesn't pay attention on the other two dimension, but we can use uh, 3D uh, RTM model. So here I'm going to show you a 3D simulation of, an, uh, of a vineyard. So this is a vineyard that we generated um, wine canopies with different uh, leaf area index with the all traits and we can train our machine learning algorithm using this data instead of the actual data and then uh, an unseen uh, image can be compared to this to figure out um, the biochemical traits that can be used to and uh, to uh, decide if the plant is under any stress uh, or if the plan needs immediate attention. So that was in uh, grape. We also do some uh, nitrogen monitoring in almond. And I think this will be my last uh, study that I'm introducing since we have only 10 minutes. Again, some background about the almond in California that I provided. Um, so, we use also remote sensing for nutrient uh, management in almond. And uh, here again, you can see the part of the electromagnetic spectra that uh, impacts different biochemical traits. And this is an almond orchard in which the amount of nitrogen for different trees has been determined. Uh, and we can see a lot of variability so the dark green are sufficient amount of nitrogen and low, uh, the brighter colors are low amount of nitrogen. And almond is a nitrogen hungry plant. It requires a lot of nitrogen. So that means if we do a little bit mistake of the application rate, we put our orchard, our trees, and also the environment in danger. So we need to have a good uh, estimation of how much nitrogen is currently available in the plant. So, uh, to predict nitrogen from a spectral measurement, we can again use different methods. But as I mentioned, nitrogen mostly impacts the protein, which has an impact on this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. I want to remind you that we can only see this part with our eye, and we can see this part with our uh, spectral camera in uh, most of multispectral cameras. So there are multiple orchards that we uh, have been collecting data from them uh, in several years. Uh, one of them is in the middle of the Central Valley, and one of them is closer to Davis area in the north part of the Central Valley. This is uh, just showing the data set uh, for different uh, data that we collected in 21 and 22, and uh, um, spectral measurement of the leaf that we collected also at the same time. And here you can see the variability of nitrogen level. So we can see nitrogen level all the way from 1.5% to uh, maybe 3%. So there is a big range of nitrogen variation. Ideally, we want all of our trees to be at the same number, maybe at 2.5, but we can see a lot of variation here. Different methods was used uh, to uh, analyze this data, data-driven methods uh, using vegetation indices such as NDVI, NDRE. Uh, chemometric, which is um, um, a kind of regression that is a benchmark for hyperspectral data analysis because it can guarantee the most potential of the spectral data in that specific application and machine learning, which is a newer kind of 
uh, field for uh, spectral analysis. It's similar to chemometric. It can yield a very high accuracy. Uh, for the physical based models, we uh, can use, uh, for example, the model called Prospect, which is a radiative transfer model. And we can use a third category of methods, which is a hybrid method. And the hybrid methods are combining radiative transfer modeling with uh, machine learning that uh, we hypothesize that will give us the best result. So uh, some information about the ground truth that we could collect. Uh, EWT or equivalent water thickness. We can uh, have this information about each leaf by using the fresh weight and dry weight of the leaf and the leaf area. Uh, leaf mass per area, which is a uh, dry weight over leaf area. And uh, N area. So the N measurement that we get from the lab is uh, normalized by mass. But when we use remote sensing, we are actually looking at area. So we need to convert nitrogen label to an area. And that would be uh, a good label for the data that we collect. Here, I want to compare uh, five different uh, spectral analysis method. So first of all, uh, Let's start with vegetation indices. This is the most common use of remote sensing in agriculture because that's the easiest way to use remote sensing. And we know remote sensing is a very complex problem. It's actually an ill post problem. So uh, simplifying remote sensing data with vegetation indices in most cases will misguide the user. And here we can see that NDRE, which is a normalized difference red edge index that is um, commonly known as a proxy for nitrogen, does not have a meaningful uh, relationship with nitrogen area or nitrogen mass. So on the top, you can see mass-based comparison. On the bottom, we can see area-based comparison. Chemometrics, as I mentioned, uh, is the best available method because it can um, retrieve the most potential of the spectral data, uh, but we don't know what are those potential. That's the problem. And it cannot be transferred to another unseen data set. Machine learning, which doesn't project the data to a new space, but uh, it tries to use some kernel or some other data optimization to improve the accuracy. And we can say the accuracy at the area base can be up to 82.82 uh, R square. For chemometric is still so high. Uh, for physically based method, uh, we use only protein as a proxy of nitrogen. And we can see here only using one feature, which is protein, can give us 0.63 R square for area based, which is very good. And this result is also consistent. So different data sets which are shown with different color here uh, are pretty much following the same pattern. But here is what I mentioned would be the best promise for the future, which is the hybrid of radiative uh, transfer modeling and uh, a machine learning algorithm called random forest. And we can see that it uh, had the best result. Why this is better than this? Because this is transferable and generalizable. This is not transferable and not generalizable. This is a black box that we don't know what's going on inside and what is related to what, and it might not work for another portrait. Um, some uh, comparison between N area and N mass and vegetation indices. Uh, and um, so uh, the gray one is combined and we can see there is no consistency in uh, using vegetation indices. 
uh, here are some other interesting results. So here you can see uh, the correlation between NDRE, which is supposed to be a proxy for nitrogen, but we can see it's highly correlated to chlorophyll actually uh, in all three data sets. This is a correlation between chlorophyll and N that many people are rely on chlorophyll to see how much nitrogen are in the plants. And we can see the correlation is very weak. And also correlation between chlorophyll and N mass. So it stays the same, uh, very weak. Uh, this shows why protein is a better proxy for uh, nitrogen. So here we can see that only 1.7 portion of nitrogen is in chlorophyll. And almost 70% of the nitrogen is stored in proteins. So obviously proteins would be a better proxy for nitrogen, but the thing is that protein is much more difficult to be sensed compared to chlorophyll. And these are the um, results of uh, radiative transfer modeling using Prospect Pro. And we can see the histogram of variation between uh, in different plant traits. So is chlorophyll a good estimator of N? We can look at this. Uh, chlorophyll was consistently low in N area was consistently low in N mass. But look at protein. Protein had a very good uh, result, high result consistently among different data set in both N mass and N area. So that confirms that protein is a much better proxy for um, N. So uh, we are over for with one minute. So I'm gonna just introduce some of my team member who are in this uh, photo uh, and um, most of the, all of the success from my lab are because of these uh, outstanding researchers and lab members that I have in my lab. So um, I would like to give them credit and thank them for all the effort and uh, contribution to this field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prisa. It was really an interesting and very informative session. Um, I'm sure people really liked it. I think I personally, even though I'm not an agriculture student, but of course I have, we have decent amount of experience. I, mean, I have decent amount of exposure to agriculture and working with agriculture universities. I'm so intrigued with what we can achieve with digital agriculture. I mean, like your, your research, is amazing the kind of work that you've been doing at agriculture yeah. at the digital agriculture lab i'm like with so many universities i have got some messages privately as well from some because there's so many professors also have joined this session and they have been asking me how they can actually collaborate with you on your work like you know so if you and the first question that we would like you to answer is this um and before that i am also joined by my colleague uh Pilika Bhatia. she is the senior manager uh, partnerships for Adora, and uh, she will take the uh, Q&A from here as well. The reason is because I have uh, two little babies, twins, and one of them just uh, woke up, so I will have to attend to him. So Tulika will uh, will fill in for me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but yes, uh, Dr. Pureza, we would like to know how people can collaborate with you from different universities on your work. Of course. Uh, so. Um... We all pretty much familiar with AI, and we know that uh, a good uh, AI model is the one that is trained with high quality data. So, and with a lot of data. So it won't be surprised if it see an unseen data that um, it has not been trained for. So one way to collaborate is to uh, define a standard for data collection and aggregate all these data so we can have uh, more diversity 
in the type of data and also in the plant and in the state. Uh, that could be an effort, a worldwide effort that everyone can join. And uh, I'll be happy to collaborate with anyone who wants to participate. So if you are doing remote sensing in agriculture, if you're collecting data, spectral data at ground level, and you can label them, uh, we can have all our data in the same place. And then uh, the models, the spectral models that Ex will be extracted from that um, would be uh, higher accurate, higher accuracy and probably more transferability. Another area is, uh, of course, with exchanging uh, scholars uh, between different universities. And that's a very common practice at UC Davis. So many other universities have close relationship with UC Davis especially with the plant science department, which is number one. And uh, that opens a lot of uh, opportunities for collaborations. Um, I can host uh, exchange a student as I have done a lot in the past from many different countries, including India and Thailand. And I can also travel to different parts of the world to meet all of these amazing researchers that are doing uh, research, maybe some of them with very limited resources, but they have the enthusiastic, they know the problem and they want to be part of this uh, paradigm shift. Awesome, lovely. I mean, that really opens up. Pirika, probably you can take note of this, you work with agriculture universities. Like this is a great opportunity for people to collaborate with UC Davis and with Dr. Ali Reza Perezza. With, their, with different data sets, of course, that brings richness to the data set and that really helps AI and ML models. Apart from that, just also want to explore, um, uh, can they also join UC Davis uh, or come to UC Davis to your uh, lab for, for a boot camp, kind of a, like a week boot camp or a two weeks boot camp and work with you and see everything in action with you and your team? Of course, yeah. So as I mentioned, I used to have a summer boot camp, which was a 45-day okay. uh, training session, including uh, training in the classroom and then practicing what they learn in the lab. Uh, my lab doesn't have the capacity to facilitate the logistic of this program, but I will be able to provide the training and this uh, curriculum and also the field visit and um, everything that is related to education itself. But I know there is a lot of other aspects of these through like invitation and visa and entry and some other paperwork that university UC Davis has a unit for that. So they okay. are mostly hand uh yeah there is definitely opportunities and um if uh, anyone wants to learn more they can reach out to the global F at uc davis which is a very good starting point wonderful um so i think you know you have the q a uh in the q I mean, yes. question the q a section uh Tulika, yes. over to you you can help dr pereza with the q a Thank you. Thank you very and, much. And, and we don't have much time because it's really very late for so many yeah. people. Uh, so I think maybe around 20, 25 minutes. Please. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Alireza. It was wonderful, wonderful. I think it excellent masterclass. Uh, hello, everyone. Also, Dr. Uh, Alireza, can you see the questions in case if you want to pick up the question and somebody wants to come? And uh, yes. I've uh, so we can begin with Dr. Pankaj Kumar. Uh, I, can you see these questions, uh, Dr. Ali Reza? Are you starting from the top or? Uh, yeah, so he's uh, Dr. Pankaj Kumar. He's asking, according to your uh, experimental unit, wet lab and dry lab data are comparable. I, I so, don't... Uh... That's what I'm yeah. trying to understand. So, so what exactly is he asking? Maybe we can. Okay. 
So, so uh, I go to an, another question, uh, Dr. Ali uh, Mazin. He is asking, what is the statistical program that you use to analyze the data? Could you? A statistical program. Okay, so yes. we use uh, most of our data analytics in Python and uh, with the data science packages that uh, are available in Python. So yeah, all our uh, processing and analytics are done in Python. Well, some students prefer R, but uh, that's that's not common. So mostly we use Python. Oh, great. I think he got the answer. So I am, uh, like some, some people have raised their hands. One of them is Dr. Shakti Ranjan. Uh, Dr. Shakti Ranjan, would you like to come and uh, talk to uh, Dr. Ali Reza? Okay, so this is Myram. Uh, yeah, Myram, you raise your hand, and do you want to do you want to ask a question? Can you please ask? You need to unmute yourself to ask a question. So I have upgraded you as a panelist. You can unmute yourself and ask a question quickly. Okay. So we can move to Shakti Ranjan. Okay, Shakti Ranjan Das, would you like to ask you the what's your question? Can you please ask your question? You need to unmute yourself to ask, ask your question. Kindly unmute oh. yourself. Yeah. So in the meantime, we can pick up the questions. Dr. Adir, is yeah, I can see the question. Yeah, please, please answer the questions. Like whatever questions you think you want to answer, please pick up the question and answer. So I read the question for everyone. How can farmers use this AI technique and digitalization method effectively and efficiently? How they can be empowered in such an extent so that it can reach to each and every farmer? So definitely a good question. Uh, for everywhere in the world, because these are the technologies that are mostly a state in academia. And uh, what is available in uh, commercial uh, um, area is the, just the simplified remote sensing models that, as I explained, can be misleading instead of being helpful. So in order to farmers, to have access to this kind of analytics, there should be uh, commercial companies and third parties that uh, can jump in and uh, provide this as a service to the growers because most growers won't be able to do this by themselves. It requires a lot of resources to calibrate these models and uh, if girls wants to join together to form a co-op and uh, that co-op provide these services to all of them, that would be another uh, avenue. But definitely this technology needs to be transferred to industry. Uh, and uh, I think that process is different in different countries. So um, I, I'm not sure how it would look like in India. But uh, in the US, there are a lot of companies that are working hardly on this kind of uh, modeling. And um, probably in a few years, we will see them providing services online. So thank you. And now I have upgraded Ria. Ria, can you please unmute yourself to ask a question? You raise your hands. That's why. I've, uh... Okay, so Ria doesn't look to be interested. If you can pick another question, Dr. Andres, at the meantime. Um, so. Okay, so some of the questions are actually comments. According yeah. to your experiment, wet lab and dry lab data are comparable. So, so I, yeah. Wet lab, so. Uh, 
the way that, that I interpret this question is dry lab is what we get from the sensors and wet lab is what we get from the chemical analysis. Um, yes, they are definitely comparable uh, if we look at the right place. Most of the cases we look at the wrong place. Well, all plant traits correlate together. So if something correlate to chlorophyll, but we are looking for protein, we still will have some kind of accuracy between 40 to 50%, which could be misleading. So if we look at the right uh, spectral region, definitely they are comparable. Um, what is the statistical program? I answered that. Uh, are you so looking at anything? Do you want to ask your question, please? Do you want to ask your question okay. like to Dr. Ali Reza? I, you, can, you may and may not switch on your camera. That's absolutely fine. You can unmute yourself. And, okay. You can ask your question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Actually, all these participants are from agriculture background. They're the professors or the students or, you know, uh, I think we can move to the the, the question. <clears throat> so there is one question. Are you taking any PhD position next semester? Uh, UC Davis is on quarter-based uh, system, and I already hired a PhD student for upcoming year. Usually, if there is an opening in my lab, PhD, or other positions, I will announce that in my lab website. So I recommend that you check my website to see if there is any position available. There is uh, another question about access to the slides. Again, many of these uh, slides, the uh, information I uh, presented today are uh, based on our publication. So I uh, refer them to check out my um, our lab website that you can find a lot of this information there. Uh, I talked about the collaboration. Another question from uh, Tabdil Gil, I guess if I pronounce their name correctly, it was wondering if you are using multispectral or hyperspectral sensors for the yield. It's a very good question. And were the results you showed based on reflectance from the almond plants or they were using classification approach? So uh, hyperspectral sensors are the sensors that we use in our research because it gives us um, very high spectral resolution so we can carefully look at different wavelengths. But that's not uh, something that girls can use because first of all, operating a hyperspectral camera is very difficult and time consuming. Uh, it's not economically justifiable for a girl to purchase and use that. Some people still do that. Uh, but multi-spectral cameras are accessible, inexpensive, and people can use that. So whatever research we do at the hyperspectral, we want the output to become a multi-spectral model. Uh, and uh, yes, many of these results are based on reflectance. For example, the method I explained for bloom density, it's not 100% of reflectance. We are, we are detecting objects. And we as long as we detect objects, we don't care about the reflectance. But for nitrogen, definitely reflectance is a major factor to take into account. There is another question for the nitrogen and yield prediction. Which bands of the spectrum were most efficient at predicting yield and which specific machine learning models you use for both yield and nitrogen prediction? So yield is one of, yield is actually the most difficult thing to be forecasted or measured using remote sensing. And there is no specific band to that. So usually it's, uh, predicted through some primary um, traits that can be extracted through spectral data. And also we look at the yield potential. For example, we look at how much light can be uh, intercepted by a plant canopy that shows us the upper bound for 
maximum potential photosynthesis and maximum amount of carbohydrate that can be generated. Well, obviously, plant cannot reach this maximum potential, but that's usually the information that we need to determine the rate of fertilizer and the rate of water that we need to provide to our plants because we need to satisfy all the plants and make sure none of them are hungry and that's what we need. Uh, so there is no specific band for yield. Yes. Thank is there you. someone? And yeah, Dr. P.S. Kananwar, uh, would you like to ask a question? I've allowed you to talk. Uh, first, let me thank Ali Reza, Professor Ali Reza for my nice presentation. Of course. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. you are audible. Please. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, it was a yeah. very nice presentation. I, I come to know some new aspects of agriculture. I am working in the field of water management. Uh, is there any, any new things uh, just like AI yeah, and innovation digital agriculture related to water management or soil moisture related things in your lab? And if at all they are there, then can you get some hands on training? So, if I understand the question, is that if there is any specific model for water yeah. uh, monitoring? Yes. So, uh, so, plant temperature, first of all, to okay. start with, is a very good indication of water stress because if we look at an, a field, and we have some temperature variability, the part of the field that is cooler is well water and no stress. And the part of the field that shows higher temperature definitely uh, is suffering from uh, water stress. But um, combining thermal data with um, multispectral data. So if we have the ability to measure light in shortwave infrared, we can, uh, I showed you a few water absorption band that is directly related to the water content of the plant. And that can be used also, but as I mentioned, uh, short wave infrared cameras are rarely available. <laughs> but uh, what is a common practice as like the best water management is to combine multiple methods. So you come, you collect the multispectral data to see if the plant is under stress. We don't know if that stress is from water or like disease or nutrition deficiency, but we see there is a distress. We look at the thermal uh, data to see which uh, part of those stressed area has actually higher temperature. And um, we also have a network of soil moisture sensors in the field. So we know how moist is our soil at the different location. We look at the weather data and we estimate ET. So by combining all of these and using an energy balance model, we can uh, have an estimation of how much water the plant and when uh, the plant is need. need and uh, how this water requirement is changing from one location to another location. Thank you. Uh, I hope Dr. P. S. Kanbar, you got the answer of your question. Thank yeah. you for your question. Uh, Devika, would you like to ask a, a, a question quickly because, because we are about to uh, you know, end the webinar, uh, the masterclass. You need to unmute, yeah, yes. Thank Hello, you, sir. Hello. Yes, you're audible. Uh, yes, sir. my question was like the country like India where uh, small and marginal farmers are dominated. So uh, it don't like AI will not be feasible, right? And uh, uh, as the land also are uh, heterogeneous, like uh, there are very, there are many variations within the land. So how will AI work for them? Like, will that bring a, a great revolution in country like India? Well, uh, of course, some part of this uh, transition requires policy and involvement of government by providing incentive to growers who adapt this technology as, uh, that not only improve the productivity, but also reduce the impact on the environment. So government, local government, and central government play 
a very important role in this transition. But some of this uh, technology can be also done by the grower themselves if they have the ability to access some of the sensors or analytics. So even if they don't have access to a drone and a camera, there are a lot of satellites uh, available for free. And um, just the ability of looking to your crop from the above will give you a much better insight rather than looking uh, at the crop at the ground level. So uh, I recommend people start exploring these tools that are available freely to them uh, and also encourage your government to incentivize um, these services and these applications that uh, can, as I mentioned, can improve the yield and also can uh, reduce the impact on the environment. Thank you. I think it should be a combined effort. Thank you so much. It was uh, yeah. thank you so much, sir. It was a great explanation. I was convinced. Thank you. Thank you, Devika. Uh, Arjun, I have uh, added you. Have, I'm allowing you to talk. Can you please ask a question quickly? Arjun, yes, thank, you thank you for being here at uh, for uh, this webinar. Yeah. Uh, Do you want to ask some question? questions? Yeah. Yes, two yeah. questions. First is if uh, is any problem with if we have a small form, for example, two meters with two uh, about four in and uh, if um, uh, Europe and we have a problem with the fire here at some region, if uh, we, we, you have any recommendation about uh, sense yeah. what uh, alternative or uh, anything else uh, for uh, prevent uh, the fire at our farm? Okay, so um, the technologies that I explained are mostly used for monitoring. So that gives you the insight and then you need to use another technology to implement that. First of all, for a small farm or large farm, it depends on the crop and also it depends on the size of the plant. So if you're dealing with a small plant, a small area, definitely you need high spatial resolution. So you need to use a drone or uh, some other kind of imaging. So you have resolution to make 100 uh, hectare of wheat, then a satellite imagery will also work. Uh, regarding the second question on how to prevent your farm from fire, uh, again, I I don't, I didn't understand exactly how this could relate to remote sensing, but there are remote sensing applications okay, to monitor fire. Can I add something, can, can I add something else? Uh, for example, at Greece, uh, uh, at, at uh, July, the temperature is going up to four, 14 degrees and the mountain are in the fire and the helicopter and drone needs to, to call for the, uh, for add more water to prevent the fire and uh, have any, uh, for example, uh, some sensors we can use uh, if is um, uh, uh, if we have a low humidity at the at the mountain uh, we can um, uh, add some water at at this place or anything else. It's is not a big solution, but it's more to prevent the fire. 
but most of fires are from the uh, the 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 uh, the man or uh, they um, they fire the plant for the next year to be more uh, uh, powerful for another uh for example if one year's one year you use for the watermelon another year you can use for uh, uh for uh, example another uh plant uh but uh, the f up to full 15 uh, percent of the fire is from the persons that they uh, that they uh, uh fire the plant or the mountain but uh, uh, for the uh, countries is for um, um, a mi minus minus three or fire worker is more problem uh, and i think in that uh, way for to have any uh, a solution for the for the fire work uh, for example yeah, uh, so we're running short of time. I'm sorry, Arjun. I think your question is all about how AI innovation in digital, like digital culture yes, yes, yes. save us from, from these fires. So in short, I think that's that's Ali, Dr. Ali Reza, uh, and I understand from your explanation. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank I can you. briefly answer that. Uh, so we have been dealing with the same problem in California. As you know, there is one of the biggest fire, wildfire is going on right now in California, in Southern California. And uh, the impact might be different from location to location. So one impact that we have is uh, the, um, the ashes of the fire that uh, fall onto the crop. And uh, for example, a few years ago, there were a lot of ashes uh, fell on grapes in the Napo Valley, which is uh, producing wine for the most expensive, uh, for producing grape for the most expensive wine in the world. So they lost a lot of crops because their crops were contaminated with ash. Another thing uh, is that maybe the fire had some impact on the plant, the, it caused some stress, and uh, definitely you can use remote sensing to detect the uh, spatial variability of that stress. So um, other than that, I think uh, that would be a local problem and some policy problem that probably not very relevant to remote. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we are at the end of this. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so that's I appreciate Thank you very much for yes. all of you. Thank you. That, Sorry, uh, Lofer, we, you can you can leave your question in the uh, chat box and we can definitely get back to you. Thank you, Dr. Course. Ali Reza. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you and, very much. Uh, yeah, thank you. And we'll, we'll come back with more masterclasses. And Dr. Ali Reza, was, it, it was kind enough to give his time to us for this class. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali Reza. Thanks for Thank you. giving it time. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night.